Okay, so welcome to the third in our series um, of coaching skills. We're going to be looking at our session this time called Thanks for the Feedback. Um, just before we get started, want to just um, uh, cover off some logistics. Our host for today, myself, uh, David, and we have our special guest, Victoria, who we'll be introducing in a few moments. Um, sound and technology, uh, as usual, when we first start, sometimes our sound um, doesn't quite sync and catch up. So we'll give it a few moments. If you have any technical issues, pop into the chat here or you can email Scott. He'll be monitoring things for us on the back end. Um, and then finally, the user tools and type pieces. There's a little icon at the top. You can click on the drop down, um, raise your hand, that sort of thing. The chat window is going to be there for the whole time. So if you do have any questions or anything, please feel free to pop in. And as always, we accept applause. Okay. So um, our opening thought for today, uh, and this comes from Anne-Marie Hotelling. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing her name right. Um, feedback is free education. Uh, seek it with sincerity and receive it with grace. Now, our whole session today is about feedback. And it's interesting because as humans, we crave feedback. One of, the, one of the worst things you can do to a human is deny them feedback. If you look at even the most hardened criminals, uh, you know, the way we, we end up punishing them is we put them in solitary confinement where there is zero feedback. Um, so we crave that feedback. It is free education, but we need to seek it out. And, and I love this quote because it's seek it with sincerity. So really be sincere about that because sometimes, you know, we ask for feedback and we don't really mean it. Um, but then we also need to receive it with grace. And we're going to dig into that a little bit uh, as we go through our session today. But I'm just going to start off with a poll. Actually, I'm going to start off with three polls. I'm just going to open them up real quick here. <clears throat> um, so our three polls today, just to kind of get a bit of a baseline as to uh, what our audience is like today. Uh, do you have direct reports? Do you manage projects? And do you manage people who are not your direct reports? So you may actually say yes to the first and third. Okay, we've got our, our early adopters who have, who have gone in and, and answered the poll right away. So thank you guys for that. Um, give it a, a couple more moments to let a little bit more of the population uh, catch up. All right. I'm going to end these polls. And let's display the results. Okay, so let's take a look at our audience today. Um, do you have direct reports? We have a 70-30 split. So uh, majority do not. Uh, so 70% do not and 30% and do. Okay, interesting. Um, do you manage projects? No surprise here. 90% are saying, yes, I do. We've got a, a very project management um, uh, group today. So, you know, 90% uh, managing projects, 10% not. That's That's very understandable. And then finally, um, how many are you managing uh, are people who are not direct reports? And again, not surprising results here. If you've got people who are managing projects, we're typically uh, trying to manage people who are not our direct reports. So that's always going to be key. Okay. Now, this leads us straight into our uh, another, and this is a, a baseline setting question here. I want to understand what is your biggest challenge when it comes to giving feedback? Um, so take a few moments, reflect on that, think about what are some of the biggest challenges that you have when it comes to giving feedback. Let's take a look at what we're getting here. So from Judy, trying to be positive in my comments, not just critical. Oh, love that one, Judy. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to dig into that today. Because, um, of course, the term feedback often implies a critical conversation and not necessarily a positive one. Uh, from Allison, finding the appropriate time uh, in a group setting is not always appropriate. People tend to scatter quickly, grabbing individual without waiting too long. So you know, getting that whole um, you know timing piece is going to be very key. Absolutely. Uh, from Elizabeth, not articulating it while saying the wrong thing and offending someone. Oh my goodness, Elizabeth! And especially in today's world of of some hyper political correctness, sometimes it's uh, it is very difficult to navigate that. Um, and we think about our environment, especially here in Canada, with you know very multicultural, very diverse populations, uh, and that diversity is is not only you know the cultural, your ethnicity, or or as um, the First Nations chief likes to refer to it as your your DNA, um, but it's also around your experience because you know um, we've got four generations, really five generations into the workforce now, 
and uh, you know different things at different levels and different people and you know experiences etc so yeah absolutely uh, from Diana uh, fear of negative reaction from the recipient that's an interesting one Diana because you actually said fear of the negative reaction so um, when you're approaching it I, I'm getting a sense that this is from your side and you know this sort of builds on what Elizabeth was saying um, that's a, that's an interesting one and I think I think we've got to have some good feedback from our, our guest speaker today around that to, to help us with that uh, Dion Sanders assuring the recipient does not take it personally yeah and you know the um, we need to be cautious with things like you know ensuring we can only do our part so um, we need to make sure that you know we, we take responsibility for our piece um, you know so we're going to do what we can around that but you know sometimes it is it is taken that way now I'm gonna I'm gonna answer the question as well because um, like I say we do have a, a guest speaker in today um, for me um, it not being received well and, and we saw that in a couple of them but it not being the right time um, in, in my career as a trainer I've been a you know facilitator trainer for about 25 years now and I love my work I'm very passionate about it um, and I get very very eager and sometimes I get a little too eager and I, I try to provide feedback when it's it's not welcome or appropriate um, so that's always that that's been a big thing for me around uh, you know getting the right timing um, for feedback so with all of that I think we've got a great baseline now let's introduce our guest speaker Victoria um, so she appeared a few moments ago I know she's on the line um, if she can just return back oh, on her there. webcam there she is and there you are welcome Thank Victoria so I'm so glad you could make me. it I'm today really looking forward to this discussion today Oh, it's a pleasure. And Victoria, the reason we've asked Victoria in today um, is, well, first of all, she is a certified coach and has a great amount of experience. Um, but she's also someone who's very passionate about this and, and really wants to share that that experience and knowledge. So um, really happy to have her on the line today. So with, with no further ado, um, we're going to get started on this. Now, um, we're going to just do one more base setting question here, which is where do you use feedback? I'm going to ask everyone to pop in and, and identify where they use feedback. I always love it when people are multiple attendees typing. All right. Oh, Allison, love that answer. When there's a learning opportunity, yeah. Um, and we're we're gonna again, we're gonna be unpacking that. So, um, very savvy group today because um, you know not just doing it at the annual you know review time, but you know when there's that learning opportunity. Um, when asked from Julie, so Julie takes more of a, uh, you know, when when requested, and I, I could probably learn some stuff from Julie because I tend to offer it sometimes a little too eagerly. Um, I'm learning, I'm working on it. Um, what else do we have? I use it all the time when there's an opportunity from, from Laura. Fantastic. Uh, throughout the project to check in from Elizabeth. Absolutely, and that is so so key. We want to be constantly checking in. We need to establish that two way. Um, communication Judy says frequently with an exclamation mark uh, from Victoria I would like to say everywhere uh, but it might be aspirational as I mostly think about it when there's something to correct absolutely so we've got a really good group today um, it's gonna be a very savvy group so um, I want to open this to our um, our guest and Victoria yeah, why should we use a feedback great question it's been so interesting to hear uh, from everyone through the text chat your responses it's such a helpful way to begin uh, it's it's interesting I've worked inside organizations and and now of course outside organizations and and as a coach I talk a lot about coaching of course and the benefits of coaching but honestly in my experience feedback is the most effective way to encourage behavior change because it is so custom to the person and the situation um, and I guess if it's done cor correctly or effectively it's really going to um, be the best way to connect performance to the environment and and to the impact and the consequences in the situation um, yeah so it's I, I actually I kind of go on a bit of a, a rant here and say that it's it's the most effective tool in a project manager's toolkit or a leader's toolkit to effect behavior change. 
Mm -hmm, absolutely. And, you know, it, it's interesting because when I look at my role as a facilitator trainer in a learning and development context, but I also look at my role in a project management context, and really it's about encouraging a particular behavior that, that we want, whether that be, you know, I want my team members to, you know, build the tool, the thing, the product that we want for that project, or I want my students to, you know, adapt that new behavior or skill. And even as a change manager, we're looking, you know, for that. So, you know, this is a, an extreme effective tool when you say it's you know the best yeah. way to encourage that behavioral change I was just um, gonna say it makes uh, me think about as a ahead. starting place our, ourselves in our own work in our own practice thinking about our own relationship with feedback how many times we're asking for feedback from all kinds of stakeholders uh, we classically of course I think are trained in our hierarchy to think about feedback from our our superiors, but from our peers and from our direct reports and from mm -hmm. other stakeholders on projects, how often are we asking for it? What do we do with it? How do we feel about it? All of those things are really great to to consider and reflect on um, because we're we're living in a feedback fast paced world, of course. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we've got many vehicles for that, whether that's, you know, texting, remote connection, um, what we're doing today with video chat, um, you know, all kinds of ways to do it even beyond the, the classic uh, traditional face-to-face. -face. Love it. Okay. Um, so from your experience, uh, we're going to pop into another poll here. Um, how is the relationship after a feedback session? So we've given, received some feedback. What's the relationship like? We're getting some fast and furious responses. Excellent. Um, and, you know, we put this question in because, you know, we, we especially considering we think about those pieces at the beginning um, where, you know, concern about the negative feedback and concern about the, the, the impact. So I'm, I'm getting a sense that there's, there's a bit of that. Allison, I'm not going to let you do the depends. <laughs> going to pick one. Um, do kind of the aggregate or the average. Let's give it a, a couple more moments. Oh, I got multiple type E's here. I think I might have struck a nerve. Oh, you did. Thank you so much, Allison. All right. I'm going to end the poll and, and uh, display the results. This is interesting. This is surprising, actually. I, I was anticipating more uh, people clicking worse, and we, we had no one do that. So we've got 66% uh, saying the relationship was better and 33% saying uh, that there was no change. Um, yeah, it often helps to clear up misunderstandings. That is true, isn't it? Yes, a little bit ironic considering what we just uh, discussed there. So it, it sounds like uh, we've got some better relationships, but I'm a little curious now because in our opening, when I asked about the whole, um, uh, you know, wh where are your biggest challenges, there was a lot that came back around the person misunderstanding or, or they're kind of being bad feelings. So, um, Victoria, help us out with this a little bit because, you know, we should have constructive when it comes to feedback, but yeah, let's unpack sure. that a little bit. I, I, um, I really do believe and like to frame feedback uh, for, for the people that I work with uh, using this word constructive, that all feedback should be constructive. And normally, I, I think we're used to that language, but we're used to it attached to corrective feedback. So this idea that we want to be constructive if we're criticizing someone, um, and that usually means like we want to soften the blow somehow. Uh, we want to focus on what's good in addition to what's bad. We get into this whole feedback sandwich thing maybe you've heard of, where you say something good and then something corrective and then something good again. Um, I like to think about all feedback as, mean, as being constructive, meaning that even when it's positive, even when I am celebrating the great performance that someone has done, I'm still building something. I'm still building even better performance in future. I'm, um, I'm wondering how this great uh, performance can be applied to the next project or to other work streams or to different parts of the team. Uh, so all feedback should be constructive. We're always building something, better performance. So what would be your advice then if I needed to do some corrective? And let, let, let's say this is pretty like serious corrective, um, but I want to I want to still maintain yeah. that constructive piece. What would so be your advice I, I around that? I get into that? a lot of this this idea yeah. of the what 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 the expectation is. Um, 
you know, what the feedback message is and then the how, meaning how we're going to action it or what's going to be what's going to be different, which is another one. But anyway, separating that what and the how for people. And so sometimes if it's a very, if it's a serious message, there may be uh, quite a lot of direction and guidance given on what the expectation is, what the consequences were. And, and I might even get very prescriptive on the how, you know, how the change needs to happen and what exactly I need to see. Uh, for, for less serious messages, depending on the, the context, of course, the how piece is really where there's great room for a coaching conversation. So I, I want to collaborate as much as possible around that how. If, if the what of the message is set, uh, it's firm, I'm clear on what the performance expectation is, then the how is a place where we can work together and partner and determine what action steps need to be taken. Excellent. Wonderful. So really, you know, and one of the things that I noticed in what you described there is, is making it much more of a conversation and not that, that very prescriptive. So it needs to, to have both, both directions of that so that it's, it's not a, a berating. It's not a, you know, sit down and listen to me. It's, it's very much a, let's, let's constructively build this together um, yeah. as a, as a parent. Which, I mean, that word, team, right? When we hear it that, it, it's so much about relationship. And I think the very first thing to think about is if you're planning to give feedback to someone, if you know there's someone in your project right now or in your work world that, that could really benefit or that you know you need to give some feedback to, reflect first on the relationship. What is the status of your relationship? Is there trust and respect enough in the relationship for you to give feedback? Um, because if there isn't, then that's the place to start. Um, you know, because it just, it, it won't right. work. So let's hear from our audience. Let, let's, um, cause I hear some really good stuff there. How do you keep your feedback constructive? And I think we're on to question three. There we are. Um, so if you could pop into the bottom, what were some of the tips that you would give for how you would keep your constructive or your feedback constructive? And especially when we get into those corrective conversations that can be very difficult to navigate. I always love it when I see multiple attendees typing. All right, so from Judy, focus on the topic of the feedback, not the person. Oh, fantastic advice, Judy. Um, hear this in a lot of different contexts. You know, people talk about, you know, uh, conflict resolution. They talk about, um, you know, focus on the, on the issue and not the person. Don't make it personal. You know, these kinds of things. And really it's about, you know, the topic of the feedback. It's this is not about you. This is about the behavior. This is about what's going on. Um, from Allison, identify the positive and discuss how that can be leveraged. Um, absolutely, because of course, if it becomes all all negative, um, it just you know might just get into a little bit too much of the I'm um, you know uh, that that sort of feel like it's berating or you know there's no positive there. Um, with that in mind, though, be cautious with the whole you know positive sandwich um, that Victoria alluded to earlier because that's. Uh, yeah, I find that one doesn't tend to work very much, and and I'm going to be interested to to hear um a little, or Victoria talk a little bit more about that. I'm from Lauren. I always refer back to where the person wants to go, or wants to be or go professionally, and how they want to improve and get closer to that place. Oh, love that one, Lauren. So really focusing on the you know the destination. Uh, from Jeff, uh, avoid targeting the individual rather the issue. Absolutely, Victoria. Yes, love this focus on the issue behavior. Uh, rather than the person. Now we've got a couple of, of um, in the standard chat. So Julie is saying uh, include the why and the importance behind the feedback. Absolutely, because you know we need to put it in that larger context. And then from uh, Dion, um, preface the feedback with what will help us is, and then start the feedback. So very much making that um, putting it into the whole. Um, uh, you know what will help us. What you know where where we're going to move forward, and and I know that's worked very very well for me in in some difficult situations in the past. Um, so some fantastic stuff here today. We've got a a very savvy group. Um, the next area that I want to explore is is how we're going to do this. So I'm gonna I'm gonna bring Victoria back into the conversation, and how would we go about you know giving yeah, this feedback? I really like to start feedback messages with with an observation and and what's been great is 
Um, a lot of the feedback so far, your feedback in the text chat, has been pointing us to this place um, where we want to depersonalize, right? So we're, we're avoiding using things like you always do this or you never do this. Those generalizations can, uh, can really get us off on the wrong foot. And we start with, uh, an, yeah, so with no an observational feedback message. So this is uh, where we have a chance to get really specific about an action or a behavior that we observe in the, the employee that we're speaking to. And, and so what's an observational feedback message? It's something that we can observe that can be recorded on a video, right? So it's getting, it's, it's getting really specific about behavior that you observe um, that is visual or uh, audio. Um, any cue that could be recorded on mm -hmm. on a video camera. And the reason why I make that distinction so clearly is because often what happens in our feedback message is that we, we may have an observation, but then we also share some story that we have about what it means. Um, so for example, if I overhear an employee in a call mm. center who is um, who has a, an elevated tone in his voice and he's speaking really quickly and um, and he's yelling his volume is very loud um, the story i might have and it might be correct is wow you're really angry um, you're ticked off at this customer and so you're yelling at him that's not actually an observational feedback message the observational feedback message is when i when i overheard you speak with the customer on the phone i heard your higher volume voice and an angry tone in your voice what was going on for you um, and that gives you then an opportunity to check in about what you observed, right? So was it in fact about anger or was it something else that was going on for the employee? Um, and then it lets you stay a little bit more objective and curious. I love that objective and curious piece because it's, you know, we want that curiosity so that we're asking the questions and getting the information because like you say, we, we tend to jump to conclusions. And that theme of jumping to conclusions, um, which of course the second we do that, we're no longer objective. We're now basically putting that story behind it. Um, we, we have explored before in our, in our webinars um, and my, my wife, um, share with me a fantastic example for this and and I, and I love your example of you know if we if we can record it on a videotape um, and play it back you know there it is um, and you know the whole I, I observed an elevated tone and a, and a faster pace and you know this is what I think is happening you know what is going on so you know uh, being that curious um, so my wife works in the court systems and um, there was a judge who was explaining uh, the um, uh, the hearsay rule and here's the example that, that he used, which really landed for me. Um, if you see, so Victoria comes in from outside and her coat's wet and her umbrella's wet. And I could say, well, it's raining out. Well, no, I can't because I did not observe the rain. All I observed was Victoria's coat was wet and that she was carrying a wet umbrella. Um, and we do this. We, we, we jump you know, to those conclusions. So we need to climb down that ladder back to you know, what's observable. Um, like you say, you know, someone's talking elevated. Uh, they're talking very loudly, they're talking very quickly, you know, we, we could, you know, discern that as anger. Um, you know, when we talk to them, it could be, you know, we had a bad connection, there was static on the line, I had a, you know, someone who was hard of hearing, you know, maybe the faster pace is because the person was saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I don't have much time, I got to go quickly, so I'm trying to get the, the information in faster. You know, there could be a number of different, you know, conclusions or, or reasons behind that. And it is very hard to stay, you know, objective and curious. Um, to you know uh, do that so it's um, but I love that you know start with the observation what's that what are we seeing right because that's what we can we, we can use as our starting point so how do we do this what, what would be the coach approach to yeah, giving this feedback? Is a, this is a great question of course um, questions are probably part of the answer here with coaching as you know um, for those that have attended these these webinars so far coaching is often about asking questions um, and so where I find if you, as, as David, this great example that he gave, if you start with an observational feedback message, then that creates space for you to ask questions to advance the conversation. So you're working as hard as you can to stay separate from any story that you've got ticking around in your, in your brain. Um, you're staying really present with the person. 
you're um, asking questions that are sincere and you're looking to discover what's happening for the person in their own mind um, and and then you're partnering with them to create options to generate possible solutions um, and and ultimately to achieve different performance or um, a greater level of performance in the case of a, of a positive feedback message. Fantastic. Um, and, and I love what you're saying around, uh, you know, the, the questioning piece and, and staying present and sincere. Um, I'm guilty of this. I'm, I'm sure if we polled everyone today, they would all agree that they've, they've at some point in their lives done this. You know, we're, we're listening to the person talking and mentally we've checked out. You know, mentally we're off somewhere else. Um, or my other favorite is, you know, mentally I already have my answer because I've assumed, you know, where this is going and I'm expecting, you know, this conversation. And this is um, when we did our initial barriers conversation. Um, I was really happy to see how people, you know, the, the fear of the of the you know the negative feedback or you know concerned about those kinds of things so what do we do we prepare right so we plan so I'm, I'm gonna plan the conversation I'm gonna script it and now I can only write my half so I'm gonna assume the other half and you know as I start the conversation I've already anticipated two or three responses and back and forth you know and, and we get into that and you know second question in or, or second piece and I get a surprising answer if I'm not there and present um, you know, I'm not yeah, able to adjust and, and kind of work point. with that. Like we just don't know sometimes as much as we may know the people we're working with, um, we, we just can be surprised at any at any moment. And so that being present piece is is so is so important, which is back to the relationship starting point that we spoke about. Um, yeah, that all this feedback happens inside a relationship. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and there's a little exercise I do for a couple of my classes where we, um, it forces you to listen. It forces you to listen to every single word right to the very last word of the sentence before you're able to respond. And when every time I debrief this, uh, you know, I always get someone in the room who says, that was hard work, you know, to actually listen to someone and, and kind of stay present and stay there. Um, because of course, what we're doing is we're so often already composing our response, you know. And and I don't know about you, but I have done this, and I know I've I've experienced this where, you know, you're halfway through the response, and the other party says, "Okay, I'm going to stop you there because that's not what I said, right?" And especially if you know if I'm anticipating a no, and I've got all my reasons, you know, lined up, and all my arguments to try to convince you to that yes, and I've said, you know, the other party has said yes, but yet I'm still. I'm still putting my, my reasons forward. It's like, yeah, okay, stop digging. That's, that's so um, true. Like that's happening you know, so, in feedback definitely because we're wanting to maybe convince the person why we're giving the feedback, why we want the behavior to change and all of the rationale that we have in our highly cognitive, super high functioning brains. And the other thing I think that's taking us out of the present moment mm -hmm. is our own discomfort. And we had that come up in the text chat already that sometimes I, I feel concerned about the status of the relationships. I even feel fear like well, how's this gonna go how's this gonna land with the person and so that's a moment where I'm actually more focused on me and my own story than what's happening for the other person so what what advice would you give for someone um, to help deal with some of that because of course we're you know that drives us to to kind of you know turn inwards and then you know what I've, I've got yeah. my full script here and I got to get through it all yeah, um, what, what can we do to help um, combat that doing a little bit of prep before heading into this kind of conversation trying to get really clear and centered in the mindset of wanting this feedback to serve the other person um, which means I think necessarily that you have to focus on what's happening for the other person in the conversation. And then, I mean, I wish I had a magic pill for this because I think that would be great. But I think it's practice. I think that the, the uh -huh. more feedback that we give, the more constructive that we can be in that feedback, the better we are at the art and skill of this. And I would add, what's a really safe place to practice feedback is with the positive feedback messages and, and work with those first. Because I think with positive feedback, mm. it just feel, the temperature feels lower. Um, obviously, it's a positive thing, so um, we don't anticipate, at least I hope not, that it would land wrongly or, or offend someone. And it, it with the positive feedback messages can be a great starting place 
to practice adding a question, practice being constructive with a positive feedback message. So, um, you know, I saw you rock it in that project status meeting. You were prepared. You gave really detailed updates on all of your task items. That is exactly what we want in these status meetings. How can we get other team members to do that same thing? It's a positive feedback message. You're asking a question, you're being mm -hmm. constructive, um, and you're practicing these skills. Fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm loving what, what you're saying here. Um, and just, you know, really being there for the other person and getting into their mindset. And, um, you know, as humans, we tend to be very inward focused. It's all about me, right? There's the whole WIIFM piece. There's the whole, you know, we walk into meetings, we're sitting around the table with the, you know, eight, 10, a dozen people. We're all worried about how everyone else is taking what we're saying and we don't want to look bad and oh I, I'm I'm you know self-conscious that you know I I misspoke on that last sentence or I I pronounced a word incorrectly and meanwhile I can almost guarantee you that every one of the other people around the room is having the same sort of you know things running through their heads so you know and and I've done this where I've asked people afterwards around you know what do you think about you know how that went and you know I I kind of fumbled and stumbled here and this and that and they look at me like you did didn't notice right because we're all inwardly focused on ourselves so and and this is i think the real power of coaching is when we can shift and focus on the other party so to really be present for them in yeah, their so. their stays um but i just want to highlight one last piece that we, we we put on this slide here which is tying it to concrete business objectives so you know we definitely want to um, you know, build the trust. We definitely need to have that relationship piece, and and I, I love that Laura chimed in on the on the you know good advice on the practice on the positive piece. Um, we also do have to get our job done at the end of the day. Now, the the nice thing is when we when we get this right, this will actually enable us to get our jobs done. Um, so it's um, uh, you know it, it, it's not one it's it's not sort of an either or it's a you know we get both right so we get the one we it, it leads us to the other but this way it can you know help us also get back onto the the issue as opposed to the um, uh, you know as opposed to the person tying it to the you know the business objective so we've 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 kind of touched on some of these elements what's needed for effective feedback what would be the kind of building blocks that i would have to have in place yeah. well, so that i could be effective in my feedback relationship laura's just in the text chat raised that great word trust i see when i do a, a check-in around trust and respect in the relationship in order for for you to have a good idea that it'll the feedback message will land effectively and i i do want to pause there because i I think sometimes we can get in our heads a little bit about about these great positive relationships. The reality is that you know we don't we don't often have lots and lots and lots of time to become bosom buddies with everyone that we work with. And so I'd say it's not about that. It's simply about having enough trust and respect to deliver a message. And um, I mean that can be as simple as. Um, as just a little bit of eye contact and some genuine human interaction before you move into a conversation. Or, it, you know, it can be something that takes place over time, depending on, you know, how long you've worked with someone and the other context of your relationship. So I, I do want to add that. Um, the other thing, David, you just mentioned for effective feedback is, is really having it rooted in, in a business objective or project objective. This, I think, is a really important double check for people um, because it, it can often help just like that's kind of the whole reason for the feedback message. Why am I why am I giving this feedback message to to this person? What's the impact or the consequence that's that's prompting me to do it? So I think it's a helpful thing for for feedback deliverers to consider before um, before a message. Right, so a bit of that relevance, so that if this isn't just like me saying, you know, I'm I'm finding some lame excuse to attack you or, or berate you in some way. No, there, there there's a bigger thing yes, here, and yeah, and here's why right. we're doing this. Um, and again, you know, any of these things yeah. or, or this around this relevance stuff, you can you can check in with a question. You know, what's your take on it? Um, as you as you make something clear you know, to someone around, mm -hmm. around connecting to a performance objective. For example, if you see someone who's delivering a status report that's just riddled with spelling mistakes um, and it annoys you because you're a stickler for, for spelling and grammar, but you want to also be clear on how, you know, that's getting in the way of business. So, um, you know, it's creating more rework, for example, for someone to then sit and edit and, and correct the spelling mistakes. 
Um, and then you can just check in with someone like, do you, you know, you see where I'm coming from here or, or what's your take on it? Um, and then that may give the opportunity for the person to say, oh, actually, I thought there was editing happening or I thought I ran spell check or I, I don't know who knows what they would say. Um, but you're you're really grounding that feedback yeah. message in a in a business issue. Um, and I think it, it also helps takes the take the pressure off a little bit for you. It, it makes you really depersonalize the message. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I do remember a time when um, one of my direct report, well, actually, sorry, he was a peer at the time. Um, he, he got he got a bit annoyed at me that I was I was making corrections. So, so he was, you know, we were working in an IT environment and um, he was the lead developer and, and, you know, I was making corrections and sort of pointing out errors and issues and this and that. And he got very frustrated with me because he said, you know, you're just coming in and, you know, berating all my, it's like, no, you do actually really good work, you know we don't want those errors going forward into production. We don't want those to, you know, cause troubles and we want to do a better job and increase our game. And I saw him pause and reflect and went, yeah, okay. And I, I think, you know, he sort of climbed up the ladder and said, you know, oh, you're you're correcting my work, so therefore you're trying to, you know, one up me or or downgrade me or, you know, you know, unseat me because I'm senior and you're you're more junior at this point. And when I kind of, you know, went through the why with him on that, you could see him really pause and go, okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. And our relationship actually got much better after the fact. We could have that more open honest because it became about building the tools. And, you know, um, the, where I had missed on the earlier part that caused the issue is that I hadn't acknowledged uh, well enough his, his, you know, expertise and capabilities. Um, so, yeah, yeah. That, that's the relationship definitely um timing, about the timing yeah and this was something i saw in the text chat as we opened as well you know of course i think common sense for all of us uh, when we're outside of these discussions we can we can armchair feedback pretty good and we know that to be as immediate as possible is is a good thing because it's fresh in the person's mind it's fresh in your mind um and you have just the the, I think the best chances of making it as relevant as possible. That being said, and I think this was raised in the in the text chat, um, it, it may not always be the right the right moment, right in that moment. If there's if there's people around, if it's not appropriate, if you deem that it's a better you know one to one conversation, if the person themselves is just it, they're too escalated or it's too charged in that moment, then obviously you don't want to deliver a feedback message because I just, it's a waste of time. They're not going to take it. It's going to be frustrating for you. It's better just to, to let everything settle down if it's too charged and then, you know, book a book a few moments to speak when it's cooler. Right. And, and I guess if we attempt to try to push it when it's not the right time, we're probably going to be degrading the relationship and setting ourselves up for a yes. worse experience yeah, down the road. Right. I'm curious, what are your thoughts around asking yeah. people if it is a good time? Because um, that's something that I've started yeah, doing, and I've been great. finding some I good success with that. I think that asking permission, um, like, is this a good time? Can we have a can we have a quick conversation? Or I have some feedback. Is this a good time to give it to you? I I think that's really respectful. I think that that can go a long way. Um, and I'm aware that that sometimes um, with these questions, if if they um, you want to ask them only when no is an option right so if it's okay for you to hear no if it's okay for you to hear you know later is better then yeah. then absolutely ask the question it will build trust if you're asking the question and no is not an answer don't ask yes. the question because you'll just you'll erode trust right so uh, press the yeah oh that that's an excellent point yeah, no, I, I hadn't thought of it in that way, but yeah, absolutely. Because if I'm if I'm being asked, if you came to me and says, Dave, you know, is it is this a good time? And I'm like, no. I say, well, oh well, I'm gonna go anyway. So that's it's right. like, okay, Let's, well, I guess yeah. I guess my opinion doesn't matter. Yeah, that. Yeah, very good one. Um, let's talk a little bit about the place. We've been alluding to the place a little bit. Yeah, um, so this what are your is, thoughts around again, that? depending on the kind of feedback message and what you know about the person. Um, so usually, I mean, again, a common sense thing is if it's a, if it's a difficult message, a more corrective feedback message, then I think one to one is better. So finding a confidential place where you can have that discussion. Um, if 
it, again, it depends on context because if you're in, you know, a project review meeting and it's you're setting the stage for feedback, and this is the whole point to be to be open with your feedback, and you're you're all kind of sharing uh, feedback messages, then it may be appropriate to share uh, a feedback message in that more public setting, even if it's corrective. But it is about I think using your judgment and discerning um, what's appropriate or not, and then just as we spoke about ask ask if it's okay to to offer a message or if it's better taken offline um, i think that's contrasted then with more positive feedback messages where right. um, where usually um, many people are more comfortable with that in in public spaces i think it makes the, the person feel good um, and it it helps others hear the kind of positive feedback um, positive behavior that you're looking for so it's a great way to model good stories success stories that kind of Love it. Yeah. So if you're if you're looking to model more of a team based cultural behavior of an open honest discussion, uh, doing that in that kind of public space can can be useful. Um, there there's one environment where I've seen where they actually had a Monday morning um, oh bleep mess uh, meeting that they regularly scheduled where they actually got together and shared mistakes they had made during the previous week. And this was really very much of a learning culture. Um, it wasn't that we're looking to, you know, point fingers and show blame. It was about how do we learn from those mistakes so we don't, we don't, um, you know, um, repeat them. And I just noticed Allison chiming in, neutral territory works well, absolutely, because we get into the, um, um, you know, that whole, if you're on my turf, it can feel like a bit of a power imbalance. It can feel a little bit more intimidating. Um, so, you know, having that neutral territory may actually help reduce some of the stress, reduce some of the resistance to the reception of that. And just, just to answer your question, um, yes, yeah, so a little mini lessons learned on an ongoing basis. Absolutely. I'm a huge fan of doing this. Um, and whether that's within your project or just within your organization in general. And this is what's behind this whole learning organization concept where we're all learning from each other regardless of levels. Um, and there's some really good stuff out there around that. If you're if you're interested in digging into that a little bit more, send me a, a note offline, and uh, happy to direct you to some stuff. Um, the final piece we've we've been touching a little bit on culture, and and Victoria, I'd like to hear your thoughts yeah. around culture when it comes to giving feedback. You just made a really feedback. great point um, around um, kind of operationalizing these mini lessons learned meetings, to use Allison's language, or or in fact these regular weekly check-ins, whatever whatever format works. Um, I think this is this is a really great way to set a culture and a tone on your team or in your project or in your organization for feedback. Uh, one of the most important starting places I, I really believe is again um, how you relate to feedback. So are you asking for feedback? Are you doing that in front of your whole team regularly? Are you gracious when you receive the feedback um, that, that the messages that you hear? Do you action it? Do you show that you action it? How are you modeling feedback and a feedback culture on your team or in your project? Um, I think those are all really good things to think about with, with a feedback culture. Fantastic. And, and um, you know, when you talk about culture, one of the things that you said there, which I really love and I want to highlight, mm -hmm. is culture in the team. Um, you know, in larger organizations, so I was just a, at a meeting with, with uh, one of our clients and they're a, you know, 80,000 employee multinational. So, you know, you got to be pretty high up in that organization to really affect culture organization wide. But there's nothing to say that as a PM running my little project in the little tiny corner of that huge organization that I cannot affect the culture in the team. You know, we can have a culture or we do have a culture within our team. Now, is it going to be highly impacted and affected by the culture of the overall organization? Absolutely. Doesn't mean though that you can't instill and encourage and and nurture some of those good cultural elements that you want and potentially even reduce some of the you know bad cultural elements that might be you know you know sort of seeping in from the the larger organization um, so you know when we look at that um, you know every working unit has a culture um, I could even say that Victoria and I you know, putting this webinar together, we have a culture of how we work together. And, you know, I actively put some things in place to, to you know, help it create and, and, and encourage the culture that, that, you know, I wanted to have for this. Now, 
good news is I had to do very little work on that because we already have a good working culture outside of you know these these uh, webinars. But you know, leverage what you have, but then also be aware that you may have to you know work around some things and and do some things that that might you know overturn uh, a kind of larger organizational cultural issue. Um, I remember working with an associate a while back. I was in an environment where the organization did not have a very good culture and it was it was very dysfunctional and um, not really a good place. And when, when him and I sat down, what we did is we actually did a uh, like a contract between the two of us to establish the culture of how the two of us were going to work. And it was really nice because it felt like this just this little insulated pocket of, you know, good culture in that larger kind of dysfunctional piece. So it really can work in, in oh, you know, those really smaller makes me think settings. Of a, that idea of um, clear agreements is and, so important as, as you begin a project or as a new project um, team member comes on board. To have that be one of the things that you discuss with them in addition to the other onboarding you're doing, you're talking about technical project things perhaps, also talk about how they like to get feedback, how they like to give feedback. Um, bring that language into, into the way that you interact yeah. just as kind of normal, normal everyday business. Absolutely. And, and I do this with my training classes. I mean, I do a one day training class. You know, I've got my team together for one day. We're doing our thing. We've got our project, as it were. Um, and I do a working agreement. And I do this with every one of my classes. And it, it's so, so powerful and so, so effective. It really gets us kind of into that, as, as Allison says, you know, the rules of engagement for the team, right, and establish them at the onset. Now, Allison, I'm just going to give a, a quick little tip here. Um, don't give out the rules of engagement. Create them as a team. So when I do mine, and I found this to be very, very effective, and I invite you to give it a try if, you, if, you, if this is not your, your method, it, it sounds like it might already be, start with a blank page, right? I put a title at the top that says working agreement. I say, what do you want on it? And in the about three odd years I've been doing this on a very regular basis with every single one of my classes, um, I've yet to have a single instance where I didn't have what I needed on that list. And we, we all know the rules. I mean, we're all adults. We, we, we know what's typically on a rules of engagement, whether that's in a, a training class or a project, et cetera. But it's about, you know, as a participant, when Allison, you say to me, what do you want on your rules of engagement? And I start to contribute a couple. I'm much more likely to live those than if you come up with a pre-printed list and you hand this out and you say, here's my rules and you're going to follow them, right? Um, so it, it's, but I'm, I'm really reassuringly, um, you know, um, buoyed by the fact that as people uh, answer that question, that they're coming up with all the stuff that I want to see on there and that I feel that we need. I've, I, I rarely add one, and usually it's it's a minor one. It's not a it's not you know one of the key ones. Okay, we're gonna um, finish off with one last question, just as we come up on the hour. Do you ever solicit feedback, and if so, how? Um, we've been talking a lot about giving feedback. Now I'm curious around if you solicit feedback. We've got a pretty savvy group today, so I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating some answers here, and let's see what, we, what comes up with. So from Judy, yes, uh, mostly when preparing important documents or presentations. Okay, so in the preparation phase. Um, from Malar, uh, I always ask the team, do you want me to improve anything? Uh, like communication, skill set, etc. Love it. From uh, Lauren, uh, yes, all the time. I ask for it. Okay, we'll give it a few more moments because I see some more people are typing. And just as I expected, I'm seeing lots of yeses. Yes, through email, lessons learned, process, in-person conversations. So Julie's using multiple streams here. Um, you know, you've got the email, you've got the lessons learned, you know, built right into the process, the person conversations. Allison, if I'm running a training or facilitation session, I use surveys. Great. So we've got that that sort of non-confrontational um, way of communicating, right? So you can you know write that note and pass it off. It can even be anonymous if you want. Um, found it interesting. Not everyone. Um, oh, sorry, I jumped a line there. Surveys invite people to reach out. If it's a presentation to upper management, I would ask principal stakeholder for feedback after the fact. Oh, love that point, Allison. Yes. Um, so, so key if you've got, you know, uh, key stakeholders in the room. From Melissa, um, yes, and I found it um, interesting, not everyone readily provides it. I've asked verbally in email, closure of a project, etc. And I think that really um, highlights what we've been talking about earlier, where it's, you know, we often feel uncomfortable giving that feedback. So, you know, it takes some courage um, to do that. So, you know, setting that environment. and. 
I, I'm going to chime in on this one. Yes, I do as well, but I overtly ask. Um, I don't, you know, sort of wait for it. I don't just say, here's a vehicle mechanism. No, I ask. I specifically say, okay, you know what? I want that feedback. You know, please, please give it to me. Um, so we're, we're just in the last couple of minutes here. Uh, Victoria, any yeah, closing just on that thoughts great, before we wrap uh, discussion up? Discussion that you that you just debriefed. I think another another way you can set yourself up for success around asking for feedback is to ask very specifically what it is you'd like feedback on. So, um, you know, I would like feedback on the, the quality yes. of my presentation materials, or if you're delivering um, a facilitation or a training session, you know, I'd I'd like feedback on the examples that I use. Were they relevant? Um, and you ask that up front, and then you can check in on that on that point at the end. So um, to be as specific as possible with your feedback request, I think can help guide people's thinking um, and and be paying attention to the thing that you want feedback on, rather than just, hey, can you give me some feedback? How did that go? Like it can some people respond with a deer in the headlights, kind of like, I don't know, it was fine. Mm. Um, so be specific. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Love it and excellent. And I've actually used that technique uh, sometimes in the past, specifically thinking of the um, you know senior management presentation uh, example that was given in our last conversation. Um, if I have a peer in the room, so if I'm coming in and let's say Victoria and I are putting a, you know a program together and we go and present senior management, we've got you know eight, ten, a dozen folks in the room. Um, you know, I'll ask Victoria ahead of time saying, okay, you know, I want to see what Bill's reaction is or what, what Julie's reaction is, you know, and, and sort of prime them so that they're kind of, you know, looking for that and seeing how it lands with those various people because um, it's not always feedback about yourself, but it's about how effective it is. Um, so, you know, to, to close off here, we'll go back to our opening thought. Feedback is a free education. Absolutely. We need to seek it. Um, we need to receive it. But you know, seek it with sincerity. Honestly, ask for it. Don't ask for feedback if you don't want it, right? And if you don't want feedback, then you know it's okay to say I don't want feedback. I'm good. Um, but then also receive it with grace, because keep in mind that this is about education. This is about growth. This is not about you know you did a bad job. It's about how can we do better and, and grow and and uh, continue. Um, so a quick thank you, uh, Victoria, for joining us today. So I appreciate much. your time.